and uh, Terry for ministering us in, in that way. This morning, one of our dear saints came up to me in the hallway and said, I've been reading in my devotions through the book of Judges, and it was tough. And it sure was nice to finish the book of Judges and get to the book of Ruth. And so uh, I would invite you to turn to the book of Ruth, found immediately following the book of Judges uh, in the Old Testament as we uh, conclude our, our very brief study in this, uh, this little four-chapter, uh, maybe like a magazine article that we've been looking at just for the past few weeks. Now, if you've not been here, you probably know the story, but just in case, let me just refresh your mind. The Ruth, book of Ruth is about a family of four, a mom and dad and two sons, Elimelech and Naomi, dad and mom, and Malon and Kilion, the two boys, and they lived in Bethlehem. Yes, the same Bethlehem we'll be talking about in a few weeks. And there was a famine in that land. And so as any family would do, they had to find out where the food was. And they heard that food was available down in Moab, down just southeast of the Dead Sea. And so they traveled down there because that's where food was, and there was no food in their hometown. And while they were down there, the boys grew up, and they met two women of that country, Moabites. One was named Ruth, and one was named Orpha. And they got married, and, and they lived happily ever after. And after a while, then the, the patriarch, Elimelech, died. And some ten, yet, ten years later, as we're told, then both sons, um, Malon and Kilion, also died, leaving three very sad, mourning widows. And, and so Naomi thought, well, I just need to go back home. She had heard the famine was over in Bethlehem. And so she said, I'm going to go back home to Bethlehem. And she said to her two daughters in love, because she loved them so much, she said, you need to stay here, start new families with, with the men of this country, and I'll go back to my hometown. You know the story. And Orpha, after many tears, uh, left and went back to her people in Moab. But Ruth clung to Naomi. And she said, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so Naomi relented and let Ruth come with her to back to Bethlehem. Widows have nothing like orphans. And so they were at the bottom rung of the social ladder in Bethlehem, as was the culture of that day. And so the law permitted them to go into the fields and to pick up leftover grains that the harvesters uh, would leave there. And so, so Ruth did so. And she happened to come upon the field belonging to Boaz, a near relative. And they struck up a friendship, and it developed into a romantic friendship. And uh, it was perhaps still platonic, perhaps, because uh, one of the symbols we have in there is found in Ruth chapter 3 and the, and the 11th verse, because Moab is saying, all the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character, Boaz says to Ruth. And last week we ended chapter 3 waiting to find out how this would come to pass. And you know the story, and Major Pam read the culmination, which is fine. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, just wait and see what happens because it's all going to work out somehow. We talked about different uh, cultural um, traditions that came into play last week, and we have another one of these this week. And one of these is a legal transaction that had to take place. And chapter 4 talks about this legal transaction that Boaz uh, called together. Now, this was done with the highest level of integrity. It was conducted in a public place. In the adult Sunday school class this morning, we talked about the fact that the court was held usually outside the city, in, just outside the main gate of the city, because everyone came by there, and court was held there, and that's where contracts were sealed. And the sunshine law we have in many places was not new. Back then, there was a sunshine law. People could see what was happening according to the law. That was the custom of that day. And Ruth's personal desires were clearly evident to Boaz. In verse 9, she talks about, she indicates that she is interested in him perhaps taking her under his wing and perhaps leading to marriage. And she knew that he had a responsibility, and she thought he was the next of kin. She thought he was the closest relative, and this would work out perfectly according to the custom there. And the custom was that, that when a, a person died without having any children, that no one would get the inheritance there of the land or, or the name that they would marry a close relative. And Boaz was a close relative. And uh, so Ruth was in the process of selling her property. 
and the closest relative was to buy that property, and she was to go along with that property and marry Boaz, she hoped. And after this request that she had made through the, in, the, in the realm of the customs that day, Boaz in chapter 11, of, verse 11 of chapter 3 says, I will do what you ask. But Boaz was a man of integrity. He was a man of high moral values, and he knew in that small little village that he wasn't the closest relative of Ruth and of Naomi because there was someone else that had the first right of refusal. And so in spite of his personal desires he may have had, and we seem to think he had these based upon the clues we're seeing in this small book, in spite of these personal desires he had, he knew that he had to do the right thing. His personal integrity was more important than his personal desires in that case. What a great example it is to you and to me, because sometimes you and I might be faced with choices in which our personal desires might bump into the right thing we're supposed to do. Now, as believers, it may be the other way. It may be that our personal desires are the right thing to do. And I pray that's the case. In fact, a very well-known Christian theologian has said something like this. He said, as a believer, I can do whatever I want. And I thought, how can that be? And he says, he further explains this, because my desires are so in line with what God desires for me, that whatever I want is also what God desires for me. Oh, that that would be so in your life and mine. But the life we lead sometimes, there may be times when what we personally may want might be at odds with what God may want for us. And they might become mutually exclusive, perhaps. We have to choose between either doing what we may desire or what is really right. And Boaz faced this choice of what he may have desired and what he knew according to the custom of that day was the right thing to do. So as we read in chapter 4, Boaz set up court outside the city gate. Everyone came to that town and so he set up court there and, and the cities were walled as you know and so people would come by there and it was a public place. So he gathered his, he found this person who, who his name is not given in our scriptures, and he said to this person, he said, come over here, my friend. Scripture tells us also he found ten witnesses to sit down and to observe this transaction that was going to take place. Isn't it amazing that when Boaz contacted this person, the person who really had the first right of refusal, the person that could very well take the woman that he desired away from him, he says to this person, come and sit down, my friend. Boaz always spoke with grace, didn't he? He always spoke with kindness and dignity. Remember in chapter 2, verse 4, he comes back from the field and he talks to his slaves, he talks to his workers, and he's a very wealthy businessman, and he says to the hired hands or the slaves, he says, the Lord be with you. And they said, and with you. That's a man that cares for people no matter what strata of society they may be in. And in chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, we see what he says to Ruth, first of all. Because what he says, he says, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord and the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What a man of integrity. What a man of grace. What a man of dignity who could have thrown his weight around. But he chose to show respect and dignity for everyone that came into his area. And so he starts this business transaction. He talks to the first right of refusal person and he says this. He says, I'm suggesting that is the closest relative to her husband, that you purchase this land and keep it. It's found in the third and fourth verses of chapter 4. Interesting word, suggesting. Don't you think he wanted more than that? He's saying, you know, here's an idea. I would suggest you consider this, my friend. Now, the word suggest in the New International Version is only found one time in Scripture in English, and it's here. Now, the Hebrew words are found throughout Scripture in different contexts, but the translators felt to use the word suggest only in this place. And the Hebrew word, I'm told, is a little bit stronger than the term just to suggest something. 
It means really to pronounce something, to declare something, to, to state something with surety and confidence. Can't you see Boaz saying to this other person, perhaps who was younger, and saying, listen, you have the first right of refusal. This is the law, and, and you have the choice to make, and this is your choice, and so have at it. He spoke with confidence. He spoke with, with, with authority. And he says in, in these verses, he says, no one has this right to do it except you, my friend. You have the first right of refusal. And then he says, if you don't purchase this land, I will. And the businessman in verse, chapter 4, verse 4, is very interesting. There's no consideration here. He says, I'll take it. I'll purchase it. Done deal. Now, Boaz was a man of integrity. Boaz was a man of wealth. Boaz was a businessman. And Boaz knew how to conduct business. And so he kept the Ruth card hidden. <laughs> and in verse 5 of chapter 4, Boaz says, You know, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with this property. Well, that changes everything, doesn't it? And so it changes the deal. I mean, this, this woman, Ruth, was an immigrant. And, and this man said, listen, if I purchase this land, then I'll be expected to marry her and produce children. That's the custom there. And, and, and they'll be heirs to my estate along with my own kids, he perhaps thought. And he knew that Jews were not to associate with foreigners like these aliens from Moab. In verse 6, he says, well, then, I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Marrying her, he thought, might endanger his own estate. It might, the King James Version says, it might mar my inheritance. He couldn't have an immigrant be a stain on his family. And his concern here was mainly an economic one, wasn't it? My inheritance is going to be messed up. I've got to go back and redo my will because of this, this, this unexpected thing in my life. She would be a bad investment, he thought, and he said, isn't it sad that you and I sometimes may feel that we might not be a good investment? Satan wants to say to you that you need to be critical of yourself. Satan wants to think of you as, as someone that, that is not a good investment for the Lord. We may be at the receiving end of a lot of criticism. We may think to ourselves in, the, in our souls, what am I really worth to God? Can God really use me? But God has chosen to invest in you. God has chosen to invest in you. You are worth it. You are worth his time. You are worth his love. You are worthy of his belonging in his family. Don't let Satan make you shortchange yourself because you are worth God's investment in your life. He reminds us in 1 John chapter 3 in the first verse, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. You are worth God's investment. Now, Boaz was an honorable man. And so he wanted to go through this process just the right way. Now, it may not have been a very good economic decision, perhaps. He may have taken a risk in doing this, perhaps. But regardless of his personal preference, he was willing for this kinsman redeemer, this unnamed person here, to take the land and Ruth, whom he had his eye on, and Boaz maybe looked beyond the economic risk to the right decision. And the contract was sealed with the next of kin. Taken off his sandal. Can you imagine people walking around with one sandal? What did, I mean, imagine the poor attorneys. Imagine how many sandals they had or, or half sandals they had. And so this kinsman reader took off his sandal and gave it 
to Boaz. And don't you know, can't you imagine in chapter 4, starting at verse 9, can't you imagine Boaz may have said this with a little bit of a smile on his face? Today, you are witnesses that if I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon, I've also acquired Ruth, the Moabite. Malon's widow is my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. Don't you know he had to control his smile when he said that? And Naomi, the lady who took the name Mara, meaning bitterness because she came back to this place physically full but spiritually empty, and she probably took back her name and said, okay, I'll no longer use the name Mara anymore. Bitterness is no longer a part of my life. I'll take the name Naomi, which means pleasant, because now I have a chance to have a grandson. And as Major Pam read, that's exactly what happened. Naomi had a grandson, and you know how important grandchildren are. And you've probably said this yourself, sometimes uh, we may be tempted to say, if I knew grandchildren would be this fun, I'd have them first, right? So Obed was born, little baby Obed. And the word Obed means worshiper. And the social famine in this little family has come to an end. The harvest is taking place. The barren tree has sprouted. Ruth was willing to move to her mother-in-law's hometown, away from her family, away from her people, prepared to be an outcast, knowing that she'd be liminal, stuck in the gap between all the help, prepared to maybe never marry. This is what Ruth prepared herself for when she clung to Naomi to come to Bethlehem. But now look at Ruth's situation. She goes from being an alien, a stranger, an outcast, an immigrant, and, and she's a poor widow as she gathers leftover grain in a field just like the poor do and the slaves do. And she's still a woman of noble character. But now Ruth becomes a wife. And then Ruth becomes a mother. God can take any of life situations and use them for his glory, can't he? You might be tempted to take the name Mara in your own life, perhaps, because of a situation you might be going through, as Naomi did. You may feel that, that God maybe has turned his back on you and maybe is not paying you the attention you need. You may feel that things couldn't get any worse. Well, don't forget this little story. Snuck, stuck between Judges and 1 Samuel. Little four chapters here of a little obscure family from an obscure little village in an obscure part of the world. Centuries ago, there's a Hebrew word I'm told called hesed, which means extraordinary faithfulness and devotion. Ruth demonstrated hesed when she chose to remain with Naomi. Boaz demonstrated hesed with Ruth in agreeing to marry her. God demonstrated hesed with Naomi and her family situation. And this is all that God asks from you. And from me is this has said, this extraordinary faithful devotion. Little Obed grew up, got married, had a boy. His boy's name was Jesse. And some 400 years after this, 400 years after this, the prophet Isaiah penned these words A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him and the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This was 700 years before the first Christmas. 700 years before Mary was told about a little baby boy that would be born. 700 years before God took off his God clothed and, and clothed himself in the skin of a baby and came down to earth. What's Isaiah saying? Isaiah saying, Jesse grew up and got married, had a son. 
And his son's name was David, King David. We know about King David. And out of King David's descendants came a young man named Joseph who was engaged to a girl named Mary. And Mary bore Jesus, whose birth we celebrate in not so many weeks. A little story stuck in the middle of Scripture that made history. Choices were made in this story that affected all mankind. And you and I make choices, don't we? You and I make choices every day, big ones and small ones. And some of these choices we make may seem inconsequential. But some of these choices we make may change someone's life. And some of the choices we make may change your life. Book of Ruth, a book of redemption a book of choices, and a book of God's faithfulness. Let's bow for prayer. God, we thank you for the faithfulness of your people. God, we thank you for the faithfulness, the the faith that Ruth exhibited when she chose to leave her own people to stay with her mother-in-law, Naomi, with whom she loved so much. Thank you for the faithfulness of Boaz in doing the right thing and how you worked it out as he would have liked, but he was willing for that not to happen based upon this kinsman redeemer who had the first right of refusal. God, we thank you for the blessings that you have brought to us today through Ruth and Boaz and Jesse, Obed and David. And God, as we make choices ourselves, may we realize that some of the choices we make may affect generations behind us as Ruth's and Boaz's did. May we take every choice for what it is to be a special thing, a gift given to you, given to us by you. And God, may we make our choices in line with your will. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we have a few moments of contemplation, I invite you, if you want to turn your songbooks to song 264, the words are beautiful there. We know the words. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath that I am never cease to worship you. We're going to sing this, the, the, the verse and the chorus with a contemplative kind of a feel. And and you may know the words. The words are up here, of course. If you want to close your eyes and pray as we sing, feel free to do that. If you want to come here and kneel, feel free to do that. Let's worship the Lord. Let's worship Him as we come to Him for guidance, as we make decisions, and as we realize the promise of God that we are worth His time. We are worth Him investing in us. Let's worship Him now, shall we? speak to our hearts these next few moments.
please stand up as we sing that chorus one more time as a song of affirmation, an anthem of praise as we shout to the Lord. sanctuary today. May you do the right thing which may be what you wish or may be contrary to your personal desires. May you have the assurance that God has chosen to invest in you and that you are worth his time. You are worth his love. And may each one of us show the same extraordinary faithfulness and devotion of which we have been reminded today. Amen. God bless you.